What is important to remember for any reactor in which multiple reactions can take place, like the two shown here, we need to account for each of the reactions only once in the energy balance for that reactor or over the slice in that reactor. So we need a term that is summed over each of the reactions J, so of the reaction 1 and reaction 2 in this case, where we have the heat of each of those reactions, and this will have units of joules per mole reaction. We need to multiply it with something that will give us units of joules per second in a CSTR, and that something must give us ultimate units of joules per second per independent variable in my PBR or PFR. So it will be cubic per cubic meter per volume in a PFR and it must give me or it must give me units of joule per second per kilogram catalyst in a PBR. For a CSTR reactor, we are simply going to substitute the extent of each reaction J in there. And this, of course, has got units of mole reaction per second. So this will make sense of the units that we require in our CSTR reactor. For our PFR or packed bed reactor, we need that incremental change in the extent of each of the reactor, uh, reactions per either the volume of my reactor or I need to express that on a mass basis along the packed bed reactor. We now need to be able to express this for each of our reactions that can take place in our reactor. Uh, and in our back bed reactor, we need an equation that we can use to express the d epsilon dv or d epsilon dw in our packed bed reactor. So we are going to start with our plug flow reactors in this case because we're already halfway there. Even for our single reaction systems, we realize that we can express our extent of that reaction J per volume reactor as what is the change in the number of moles of a specific component that participates in the reaction J divided by its stoichiometric number in that reaction, that is d epsilon, and then I've got my dv term. So if I now group these two together, I realize that that is simply equal to the rate of component I participating in the reaction J divided by its stoichiometric number as it participates in reaction J. Consider this specific example of two parallel reactions that can take place in a packed bed reactor. For each one, I've got the rate of A as it participates in that reaction, and for each one, I've got the heat of reaction at 298 Kelvin. So if I now want to uh, perform the energy balance, for a non-adiabatic reactor, of course, we've got our Q term. And here we are interested in analyzing the change in the enthalpy of the flowing streams as I increase the volume of my reactor. So this part is now the extension where I sum over each of my reactions J uh, per volume multiplied by the heat of reaction J in that slice. And if we now apply the relationship that we just derived and we choose as I our component A, over here we say that the rate in which A participates in reaction 1 and its stoichiometric number in that reaction 1 is negative 1. And this is where this min RA1 comes from for the first reaction. For that term. For our second reaction, if I now look at component I as being A, once again, the stoichiometric number in reaction 2 is negative 2, so this is where this negative 2 comes from, and this is the rate at which A participates in reaction 2. And I've got that rate expression, of course, this is going to be negative K C B C A squared. I now rearrange my energy balance to make that slope that I'm interested in. How does the temperature change along the volume of my reactor, the subject of that equation? And once again, I've got my heat transfer firm, uh, term, I've got my energy carrying capacity, and that can change along the length of the, re the reactor. That includes all the components, including the inert components in my system. 
one term for each of my reactions. And now, of course, this becomes a positive because this is on the other side of the equation. That's why that negative suddenly changed. Maybe pause and see if you get to that same expression for this slope. We can always apply the reasonable person um, test to our energy balance or the slope of the TDV. RA in this instance will give us a negative quantity. It will be RA in the reaction 1 is min K times CA. Del H of that reaction, it's an exothermic reaction, so it's going to be a negative term. Negative times negative will tend to increase the temperature. For reaction 2, once again, this term is going to give me a negative quantity because RA as it participates in reaction 2 is going to be min K times CBCI squared. It's an endothermic reaction, so a negative multiplied by a positive term. This will tend to increase the, uh, decrease, sorry, decrease the temperature along the length of my reactor. So now need to guess, go and analyze whether your slopes will in fact make sense. Which of the two terms will win does not only depend on the relative size of the two del H values. Of course, in this RA terms hidden is the Arrhenius temperature dependence of my two rate constants. If we now want to reconcile with the general form that is given in Fogler, what we must realize is that the second term here in the numerator of my dTdv slope is simply equal to the sum of negative d epsilon j dv. How does it change in that slice? Multiplied by the change in enthalpy due to the reaction as it occurs in that slice. And the negative is of course because this comes from the left hand side of my energy balance over to the right hand side. And of course then employing the equation that we derived to write this incremental change in epsilon of each of the reactions in terms of a rate at which a component participates in that reaction divided by the stoichiometric number. If I now have for instance a gas phase reaction, two um, gas phase reactions taking place in a packed bed reactor, in addition to this slope, this differential equation, I will need a mole balance for each of the components that participate in my reaction scheme. For instance, just to illustrate for component A, the total change of A per volume reactor will be equal to the sum over each of the reactions in which A participates. And if I want this on a per kilogram catalyst basis, I need to understand that my rate must also be on a per kilogram catalyst basis. I can also, then once I have the molar flow rate, I can calculate the total molar flow rate in my reaction. I need that to, in order to calculate the volumetric flow rate. Remember gas phase, so I use the idle gas law. I need that to calculate the concentrations in order to allow me to calculate all the rates that I will also need in order to complete my energy balance. Of course, in addition to the Ergen equation that you are now all familiar with and you practiced with, I can get, have a differential equation for my utility temperature because that does not necessarily need to stay constant along the length or along the catalyst mass in my reactor. In a CSDR reactor, it is important that we know that the extent of each reaction J can be expressed in terms of the change in molar flow rate over that reactor for a specific component I that participates in reaction J divided by the stoichiometric number of that component I in the reaction stoichiometry of J. The total change in molar flow rate of component I over my, CS, my CSTR is the sum of all the small del Fi as it participates in each of the reactions. So how much is used up in reaction 1, how much is formed in reaction 2, etc, etc. And now I can write this del Fi in terms of the reaction coordinate of each reaction multiplied by the stoichiometric number, as is done here in this mole balance. 
and analogous to a single reaction taking place in a CSTR reactor. I can now say that, yes, the change in the number of moles of A, if it was only one reaction in which I participated, which be rate of A in that reaction times the V, that's the traditional uh, CSTR mole balance. Now, the total change when I have multiple reactions is due to the rate in which A participates in each of the reactions, um, summed multiplied by the volume of my reactor. So from the fact that I can now deduce that this sum term, epsilon of each of the reactions, multiplied by the stoichiometric number of a component uh, as it participates in that reaction relates to the rate at which that same component participates in the reaction times the volume, allows me to calculate epsilon of each reaction J in terms of the rate of participation of a single component in that reaction. Once I now have a convenient equation for each of my epsilon J's in my CSTR reactor, it is easy peasy to populate that part of my energy balance. So what I must understand is this, that summation term is equal to epsilon of each of my reaction J's multiplied by del H reaction and I have now just reminded you over here that I have converted that to the temperature at which my reaction takes place in my CSTR from the reference temperature of 298 at which the del H of the reaction was available. Applying these principles to my two parallel reactions, but now taking place in a CSTR reactor, remember, I still have to heat up everything that comes in to my reactor temperature. So I can always just use the inlet molar flow rates of all components, A, maybe some reactants fed with my inlet as well as inerts, heat up from the inlet value to the temperature of my reactor. And now account for each of the reactions that take place in my reaction with my formula that we have just derived. So once again, we are going to choose component A because we have rates available. Of course, you can rewrite these equations, play around, see if we can write it in terms of B and C and D and mix it up. Um, but in this example, I used I is equal to A. So the rate at which A participates in the reaction 1, there we go, divided by its stoichiometric number in that reaction, which is, of course, minus 1. And that's why this negative sign is over there. And for my second reaction, rate at which A once again participates in that second reaction, I've got that rate expression available. The stoichiometric number of A is negative 2, so that's why that ends up being min a half or A2 times the volume. I can rearrange to make the temperature in my reactor the subject of that equation. And of course, then the negative signs fall away because they move from the left-hand side of my energy balance to the right-hand side. Do the re reasonable person check. This is going to be a negative quantity multiplied by the negative because it's an exothermic reaction that will tend to increase the temperature. This is going to be a negative quantity because Ra2 is min K times CBCA squared endothermic, so a positive del H reaction, this will tend to increase the temperature. Which one will win? They will depend on not only the relative size of the del H reactions, but also the rate at the temperature uh, of operating temperature of my reactor, which of course will depend on the Arrhenius parameters in this um, rate equation. Once again, Reconciling with the expression for CSTR reactors that is given in Fogler, we must realize that this numerator in that term over there is simply equal to the sum for each of the reactions, min, because it comes from the left-hand side to the right-hand side of my energy balance, times del H of each of my reactions. And this one I can write as a function of the temperature in my reactor. So if these two reactions that we considered in the example were also gas phase reactions taking place in a CSTR, uh, of course, um, I will have a few equations that I need to solve. I need to solve the total molar flow rate so that I can calculate Q in order to calculate the concentrations so that I can evaluate my rates. 
I can evaluate my, I have the temperature as an equation there, and I've got the mole balances for each of my components. Just some revision uh, on how you would perform the mole balance, for instance, for component A. It will be the sum of how A is changed in each of the reactions. So once over each of the reactions multiplied by the volume of my reactor. So I can now write a similar mole balance for all the components I that participate in my reaction scheme. What you must appreciate is that we will have a few very non-linear equations here in the set of equations that we need to solve simultaneously for all our unknowns. We can have multiple uh, steady states and we can also have multiple solutions. So it, it takes some patience and some care when we want to solve these systems in a solver-like if-solve.